how soon or far away can we see fully autonomous vehicles on our roads? Gavin Jackson, CEO of Ox Botticani, joins us today to talk about his project and how his company is contributing to this revolution. I want to call it a revolution. Welcome Absolutely. to the show. Great to, ha great to be here. Thanks for having me. Gavin, your company, Ox Botica, was the first company to, self to test self-driving cars in the UK and on public roads. And uh, I think I think the company started in 2016, if I... If I uh, 2014, 2014, founded in 2014 okay. uh, from, uh, from Oxford University. So the, the, the senior professor of Oxford University, uh, Professor Paul Newman, yeah. spun the company out of Oxford University in 2014. We're going to talk about your company's projects and uh, the infrastructure yeah. that's needed for self-driving cars. Uh, but first, your personal background, you were previously involved uh, at Microsoft, at Amazon Web Services and executive yeah. positions. Yeah. And I'm curious as to why you transitioned into the autonomous vehicle space. So it's not actually a, 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 giant, a giant leap, really. I mean, right. throughout my entire career, I've always been involved in, you know, large, horizontal, extensible platforms. You know, my, my, my firm belief and my passion has been to, you know, to build horizontal platforms that lift all uh, uh, companies within that ecosystem. So if, if, if it's very uh, uh, analogous, actually, if you think about Microsoft, you know, the world of Microsoft, they had Microsoft Windows, right? And then the worst thing in the world for Microsoft to have done would have said, we've got this great software platform and it works on one PC manufacturer called Dell and it only works for, you know, uh, booking software in hair salons, right? So it, it would have been too narrow. But Microsoft built a horizontal software platform for all applications and all hardware. And that's really very, very much the genesis of our company is that we are that middle layer, that software layer that can drive any vehicle and in any place for any vertical market. So all transportation can be transformed as a result of uh, autonomy from Oxbotica. Your software can be implemented in any vehicle yes. and make it a self-driving car. Explain how that works, Gavin. So essentially we have uh, the software called Oxpotica Driver and Oxpotica Driver lives down into the car, or into, in, into any vehicle in fact. So it could be a 600 ton truck in, a, in the sense of mining or it could be a, a, a tractor in the, you know, in the farmlands of, uh, of, of the US a or Canada. Analogous, uh, sorry, analog tractor could use this technology? So anything that has a computer right, okay. and anything that, w that can give us access to the vehicle's controls right. uh, is, is, is transformable okay. Okay. in the form of, uh, of autonomy. So right. yes. Okay, so walk us through the technology. Yeah, so essentially the, the, the founding vision of the company was uh, something that Paul, Professor Paul Newman uh, initially was referring to as it being it's an X to infinity, P to infinity. So all vehicles, all time, uh, all, all places. So it doesn't matter to us whether a vehicle is, again, a 600 ton you know, mining truck or a tractor or a construction vehicle or a small nouveau electric pod in, in, a, in a solar farm or a, 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 a shared transportation vehicle in an urban city or a last mile delivery vehicle or a truck on the road. You know, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter to us what it is. The Oxpotica driver is able to drive all of those things. And the reason it's able to drive all those things is because right from the very beginning, we built an architecture that we call Compose, which is composable to meet all demands. And so if you think about it this way, if you, if, if you're into music at all, but you'll know that if you're composing a symphony, you compose it of many, many notes. And the notes themselves are interesting, but it's only when the notes really come together that beautiful music can happen. And that's very much the same for us. We see you know, a, a truck or a vehicle or any sort of vehicle as a note, we see the domain that it's operating in. So something like on a public road that has, uh, you know, road markings and, and, and signs that humans might see versus an underground mine that doesn't even have sky to tell you where you are. Uh, it needs to be uh, composable to fit all of those. And each of those scenarios are notes as part of the composable architecture. So it means that we can drive any vehicle in any place at any time and uh, be fully autonomous. So Gavin, when we talk about self-autonomy, what level of autonomy we're talking about generally is classified from zero to five, from self, from zero being uh, fully drive, uh, you know, driver supported to five, fully autonomous, where the car can just go from A to B without any assistance whatsoever. What level are you? So we're level four plus. So le level five will be the ability to drive sort of anywhere in a random route on a, in, a, in a variable way. So the, the sort of scenario- and Level five means the car can pick its own route. Yeah, well, so the level five would, would be that you can change the routes, you know, on routes. So, you, so it's, it's, it's more variable scenarios. Whereas in level four, you're still sort of thinking about the, 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 the route you're taking, the map that you're driving to. 
And so uh, to make it commercially viable, to make uh, autonomy uh, valuable to the world, level four plus is where value exists. So that means that you can have you know, autonomous uh, delivery uh, pods that, that deliver your groceries to your home, or it means that you can have uh, these sort of 40 ton trucks you know, uh, hurtling down the freeway, uh, delivering uh, hub to hub goods to different, uh, different parts of the world. Really? Or it could mean, again, it could be a, a mining truck or construction truck or whatever it might be. Is this technology legal, Kevin? It sounds like I could just install this into my semi <laughs> and, 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 and I wouldn't have to do any work. So it's not, it's not quite as simple as that. Okay. So, so always in the, in the world of autonomy, there are different market entry points for different reasons. And they tend to intercept a number of different vectors. The first one would be, so autonomy will happen where there's the greatest value for autonomy in the value chain. That's why we think about the off public highway uh, uh, industrial use cases of being the first movers because they're so very valuable to those ecosystems. And that's why, again, agriculture, mining, construction, you know, energy plants, factories, benefiting from autonomy today is, is, is really important. But the second vector then is about regulation and the technical challenge of doing autonomy. And again, off public highway, the regulations are very different to on public highway, yeah. you know, for, for obvious reasons. You're know, moving uh, you know, rocks from one place to another or, or, or iron from one place to another or, or um, you know, corn or, you know, or, or wheat from one place to another in a farm. Is, is a lot different risk profile to, to moving people around on a, in a city or to delivering things in a city. And so, so there's different entry points uh, for, for these technologies. And that's why we're so very excited about the industrial use cases being available as early as, as, as now and, and scaling uh, next year in these areas. And then on public highways, then uh, things like goods delivery for last mile delivery and then urban uh, uh, shared mobility shuttles on fixed routes, on fixed sort of bus routes, replacing big buses, right. you know, those use cases being the most valuable things that you can do with autonomy on public highways today. I want to come back to the mining application because yeah. that's very interesting. But first, let's talk a little bit more about the tech. So um, what, just from a technical standpoint, when you're developing the software, developing the AI, what are the biggest technical challenges that a car needs to overcome in order for it to become self-autonomous? Is it obstacle avoidance? Is it route guidance? Is it mapping? What is it, Gavin? So, all autonomy systems are composed of, uh, of, of some really key aspects of the technology stack. So every, like we, we believe in the, uh, the, the, the challenge of autonomy being a general challenge. And this is why we've architected for the general challenge, meaning we can apply it to any vertical. And that general challenge needs to answer the question, where am I in the world? And again, that could be quite easy to do if you have sky and GPS and everything else. Really hard to do in the absence of any kind of network at all. Uh, and so things like radar for underground mining you know, is, is really important. So, so where am I in the world is a really important thing, down to like a couple of centimeters of, of accuracy. Uh, what's around me? How am I perceiving the, the world around me? So you know, I definitely don't want to knock into things, and so sure. I need to be able to see the world around me. And then based on those first two sets of uh, sort of complex systems and algorithms or notes that I mentioned earlier in that sure. Compose architecture, we then build a plan for the vehicle to then decide what it, need, it needs to do next. So those, those components make up what we refer to as Oxpotica driver. Okay. And so these are the things that we've been doing over the last number of years. Now, the most challenging thing at the moment is not necessarily the technology itself. That will continue to get better and better and better and evolve, just like you know, Intel chipsets get sure. better with Moore's law every year. The, the longest pole in the tent right now is safety assurance. And how do you uh, assuredly say that a vehicle is safe at any given moment? Uh, and ordinarily, what you're looking for there is is extraordinarily thing, extraordinary thing. So when you when you drive around and you see something you've never seen before anywhere in the world, on the road, off road, doesn't matter. You have to then understand how to deal with that obscure uh, edge case uh, for self driving. And so the way in which many companies have done that over the last decade is to drive endlessly millions of miles of physical hard miles. But the issue with that is that ultimately. Although your software needs to be able to find extraordinary, you're motivated to only find ordinary because you don't want to hurt anyone, right. right? So what we do is we take that challenge and say, well, look, you know, where is it that we're looking to test the application? Where are we testing here? What are we trying to prove the safety of? And it will always be a place, it will always be a vehicle type, and it will always be a release of software. So if we can recreate all of that in the metaverse, Right? And we can then say, well, let's now build some adversarial AIs 
to really give that AV system in that vehicle, in that place, the hardest time of its life, right? If we can really test all those edge cases, we can drive many, many millions of miles in the metaverse, smooth out all of those edge cases that you have to assuredly say you can deal with, and then release that software into the wild uh, later. I'm just curious when you say metaverse, is that just a more advanced version of a simulation that you that we currently have. Like That's a great way to put it, actually. Okay. That, yeah. So so think about think about it as, as being simulation, but instead of it being an abstraction layer, just simply with game tech in it, this actually believes that the AV software, the actual release of the AV software that would be on on the road in that place, is is running in the loop in that simulation, yeah. and the place itself and all the things in that place is also running in the loop in that simulation. And then what it does is it does uh, something we call data expansion and then scenario expansion where the AIs themselves are trying to find the worst case scenarios for that particular place and that vehicle uh, in that software release. And so no humans are harmed in the, uh, in, in the way of, of, of progressing safe driving, uh, self-driving vehicles. Well, safety is the number one concern for people adopting uh, self-driving cars. So yeah. let's touch on that. The statement that machines make fewer mistakes than humans and, they're, and therefore are safer, would you agree with that statement? Well, I, I would say that um, you know, what we're not trying to do is to mimic uh, human behaviors. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is to make sure that we know where we are and that we can see the world around us and we can uh, uh, guarantee that we don't hit things on, on, the, on our path through the world. That's the sort of system that we're looking to, we're looking to build but and make it indistinguishable from perfect as we go. Can you guarantee, a user might ask you, Gavin, can you guarantee that your technology would have fewer accident rates than the average human driver per year? So I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't put it that way. I would say that what our goal is, is to be indistinguishable from perfect on the subject of safety. And what we can say is that we have you know, extra sensory, superhuman uh, sensory inputs on every vehicle that we operate. Again, regardless of where that is in the world and what, what size of vehicle that is, we have you know, combinations of computer vision. So you know, am I seeing the world around me in the same way that a human might see it? Uh, we, we're using LIDARs, we're using laser to sort of rebuild the, the world around us and see things you know, as and when it's happening and measure distances and speeds and things in real time. But then we're also using uh, radar as an input so that we can see you know, much further out uh, in, in, in regards to distance and, and, and spatial awareness, as well as in the absence of uh, sky and, and, and in dirty places, you know, where dust kicks up and or, or blizzards might, might, might incur, where you yeah. can't see with laser, you can't see with computer vision. We want to then be able to rely on, on radar. So we're giving the vehicle superhuman sensory capability so that it can make better decisions than a human could do at that point. Generally speaking, what are the potential risks of failure of any autonomous vehicle, not just your system? Uh, yes, I mean, you don't have to worry about such things as uh, impaired driving uh, after alcohol consumption, but there are other risks involved when you're bringing in a host of different AI and technologies into, uh, into this space. And uh, so, what are some risks that uh, these cars might uh, face that traditional vehicles, driver, uh, you know, dri driver uh, guided vehicles might not have? So I, I think it's, it's the case where, you know, in, in any given vehicle, you need to be able to plan for every eventuality. Okay. So again, so wherever, wherever it is in the world. And it needs to make uh, good decisions. And in the absence of good decisions, for the foreseeable future, it will need to dial home to a human to say, hey, I've not seen this thing before. This is what I was planning to do. Do you authorize me to do that? Now, so, that, so there's some of the real world situations that we can envisage as being some of the challenges towards self-driving technologies you know, in, in any setting. Now, there is a philosophical debate to be had here, right? So there is one philosophic, uh, philosophy that says, uh, when the vehicle gets into trouble or, is, or, or doesn't know what to do and, and wants some human uh, help and interaction, uh, do you operate the vehicle remotely at that point, or you just simply authorize the software to do what it was going to do, or indeed tell it to stop in the, in, or do the next uh, safest action? Our very firm belief in this situation is that the vehicle should, uh, the, 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 the remote operator should authorize an action, which may be that it, it will do what the vehicle says it should you know, plan to do in the first instance, or it will authorize it just to simply do the next safest action, which might be to pull over, right. or it might be to stop, whatever it is. Under no circumstances do we think it's the right thing to do for a remote operator to actually drive the vehicle remotely. We think uh, that that's a cybersecurity risk. That, 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 uh, we got a few minutes left, so I just want to finish up the tech and talk about mining. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what levels of flexibility 
uh, does this car, does stuff, such a car have? Let's go back to your earlier example of a, uh, a fruit or a food delivery truck that utilizes this software. Suppose it's got a fixed guidance in terms of a route and it stops at you know its regular route and all of a sudden there's a traffic accident and it has to stop. Would it then reroute itself or just stop? Yeah. So, so there, there will be redundant mapped routes for any eventuality. Okay. And actually maps are also dynamic. The way that we map is dynamic. And so if they're, if they're uh, uh, roadworks appear on, on, the, on that given route, then we're able to map that and, and to skirt around that. But this is all pre-programmed, you said. The AI isn't remapping it on the spot? It's a great question. So actually, we don't rely on any external maps. So as the vehicle's going about, it's, well, well we, we can. We can rely on maps if they're available. But what the, what the vehicles are doing with radar and with LiDAR and with vision is they're creating their own maps around them as well. So it's thinking for itself in real time. Is seeing for itself, and it is then it is then mapping itself through the world. So you can recreate in radar, for example, you can recreate a map that is something like a thousandth of the size of a of a high definition map, it's and it can do that in real time. There's no human input in the reroute. In, in, in that in that situation, right. no. But if you're in mission control, if you're right. a Cardo, uh, which is a grocery delivery company that we work with, and we provide their autonomy systems for right. for goods delivery, uh, and you're managing that fleet of autonomous vehicles, then you can route those vehicles to, 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 on their mission to do what they would need to do. And you can then manipulate maps and tell the vehicle where it needs to go next. You can do those things. People are concerned about your software. Were any autonomous software being hacked? Is that a legitimate concern? And how do you mitigate that risk? So this is why we have degrees of separation between the, what the software does on the vehicle. What the, so all the software that actually is on the vehicle versus what you can do remotely. And that's why we would never say, that a remote operator can remotely uh, uh, drive and operate that vehicle. The vehicle must be completely redundant. It must have redundant algorithms. It must have redundant uh, sensors. So that if, for example, computer vision uh, has one decision and LiDAR has this, uh, another decision, then radar as a, as a third input, uh, you might need to be the uh, decision maker in that situation. And so there's always multiple routes of redundancy in each of the technology uh, uh, notes that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I'm just concerned about uh, sitting in a car that's self-autonomous and then all of a sudden a uh, malicious actor takes over my car uh, in a hostile takeover and drives me into a wall. Well, they would have to be like in the car, hacking the computer on the car. That's, that's the point that I'm, I'm making oh, is you that- You can't do that externally. You can't do that externally. You, can't, you can't remotely operate that vehicle externally. Um, I'm just curious as to why uh, a, 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 a manufacturer of an automobile like Tesla, for example, would require your services, given that a lot of vehicle manufacturers today have their own in-house development team, R&D team, doing exactly what you do. What differentiates you from Tesla's in-house team, for example? So I would definitely separate uh, what Tesla is doing from what other uh, automakers are doing. So Tesla really is, is providing a, um, a, an advanced driver assist service, an ADAS service. It's a level three and below capability, not a level four and above capability. So it's a really important distinction to make. And it's, it's one that I think that you know, regulators are gonna to have to think very carefully about in terms of how they classify self-driving systems to, to make sure that when the human is in the loop, in the case of a Tesla in level three, that they knowingly know that they are still responsible for the, for the safety of that vehicle, right. not the software. In level four plus, it's the, it's the software that is responsible, not the driver. So there's definitely a distinction there. But back to your, uh, to, to your, your, your main point about that, which is why would they work with us and, and if they've got their own programs uh, ongoing? Well, what we're finding is, because we are horizontal across uh, amongst verticals, is that our software can work with any vehicle in any given uh, scenario. So if you're a conglomerate uh, OEM, vehicle manufacturer, and you have light commercial vehicles and you have uh, passenger cars, and you have, uh, you know, uh, trucks. You know, for for, for you know, mid, mid, uh, mid trucks for for on-road uh, trucking. Then you want one universal system to manage all of those different areas. What you don't want is to overfit software from from one platform to the next. And so we have a number of uh, providers of of uh, you know, OEM manufacturers that are providing uh, the vehicle platform that we are using our software in, and vice versa. Okay. Final question, let's talk about mining. So let's say I take uh, your software, I plug it into um, a truck, or let's say a drill. What happens next? 
So ultimately, uh, there are companies out there already like uh, Wenco, uh, which is a, a, a good Canadian company, um, and they do fleet management systems for mining. So if you're a mining operator, if you're a miner, then you already have Wenco fleet management systems that you, you dispatch your vehicles to go and do the jobs that they need to do, whether it be drilling or, 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 or dumping across, uh, across different sites or whatever the, the mining job might be. And so ultimately what we do is we have Oxpotica driver that lives on the vehicle. We have the companion to Oxpotica driver, which is Oxpotica cloud that lives in the cloud. Uh, and it is then the, the, um, the API connecti connectivity between Oxpotica cloud and then Wenco's fleet management system so that the miner can then dispatch autonomous vehicles in the same way that they would have dispatched human driven vehicles. And so that's how it works ultimately. And so there are two ways of doing that. We have uh, options with partners where companies and miners can retrofit existing fleets of vehicles. And then we have um, uh, relationships uh, that are under wraps at the moment, but it's coming uh, publicly that are uh, factory fit with our software in them. All right, Gavin, excellent uh, story. Uh, best of luck with the development of your company and uh, you. hope to speak with you again soon. Look forward to it. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Appreciate right. it. Cheers. Thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lindsay. See you for more. Thank you.